today we're going to talk about really uh, sniffles, snorts, coughs, and hacks, right? It's a topic I came up with and, and sort of the terms meaning everything that we're experiencing right now. Um, so just a couple of objectives. I want to make sure we talk a little bit about the most common respiratory pathogens that we're finding uh, currently going on. I'm going to give you a little personal story here in just a moment. Um, we'll also talk specifically, as Dr. Maris men mentioned, about how we can stop some of the transmission with this. We've got some strategies that work more effectively than others, um, and then we certainly need to continue to keep our eye on the ball in terms of our aerosol generating procedures um, from that perspective. So as I've always talked about, I like to keep things extremely simple, right? Keeping in mind that our, our healthcare teams at the front line need the most basic information to keep themselves safe and frankly, to keep our patients safe as well. And so healthcare associated infections primarily, right? Not, not always, but primarily come from three basic sources. The contaminated hands that we have, our, our, our fingers, our hands, our our palms, everything that we're touching, even if they're gloved. And we see this a ton with respiratory pathogens where we're touching environmental surfaces and other things and then touching the patient. We've got sort of the second area, which is very prevalent, um, especially with things like RSV um, with contaminated environmental surfaces. And then lastly is our contaminated skin. So these are core things that we have to always be focused on despite the pathogen of concern. Now, right now, of course, we've got all these different things concurrently circulating that make it difficult for us to really rule this out. So if we sort of drop this back into the, um, the sort of lens of how is the route of transmission influenced, we know we've got contact, droplet, airborne, and vector. And so primarily for what we're dealing with, with respiratory pathogens, it's typically going to fall into the droplet and the airborne. However, for things like RSV and influenza and other pathogens, it can also fall into contact where some of this pathogen is going to fall into environmental surfaces and can survive for a period of time. That period of time, based on the literature, is anywhere from hours to sometimes days. Um, we typically find that our viral particles do not survive near as long, um, but that, that can change. Things like hepatitis B, for example, can be recovered um, in non-protonaceous blood for up to eight months on surfaces. And so it really just varies by the pathogen. All that being said, it really is just a stark reminder of basic core practices, right? Wash our hands, you know, use our PP as we need to, isolate our patients as appropriate, and keep our surfaces clean and disinfected, um, especially between patient uses. Now, the environmental sort of confounding variables that we stack on top of this about things like airflow and turnover of a room, right? Not everywhere that we, we practice is going to be like an operating room. And even operating rooms are not necessarily always optimized, depending upon the setting and sort of the maintenance schedule and all those types of things. But we can always rely that we need an infected person, right, to then be in contact with someone who is susceptible in order to have transmission. And so our goal is to sort of think about what is the primary route of transmission for things like RSV or colds or uh, flu or, or COVID, right, and then try to intervene there as much as possible. About... Uh, Four weeks ago, roughly, I think it was just a month ago, I actually was uh, in Pittsburgh for a conference. And I literally remember waking up that morning at about three o'clock in the morning of the hotel. And I just, I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. Uh, it was almost a, a very influenza-like feeling. It was very similar to what I had um, when I had flu several years ago. And, and, and I just was, I, I couldn't move really, honestly. My joints were achy, had a lot of sore throat. Um, you know, extremely fatigued, uh, overwhelming nausea, which was interesting. Um, and then probably a, a terrible headache, probably the worst headache I've had. And, you know, so I, I was bound and determined to figure out what it was. So I, I immediately put on my N95, you know, um, had to fly home, unfortunately, um, but was able to isolate myself from that sense and, and got off the plane, immediately did a test that I had, uh, and it was COVID positive, right? And so, you know, these are things that happen frequently where you have to then make that differential diagnosis in order to identify what respiratory pathogen might be present. Now, ironically, I had a very similar situation with a friend of mine that had the exact same type of circumstances, but it turned out to be strep throat and influenza. And so we're seeing so many different circulating viruses out there that can cause us a lot of, a lot of harm. I've got a, a, a very, very cute baby friend of mine uh, that is just turning one years old um, that's down the street that I just adore. And she was actually hospitalized with RSV about two weeks ago, became very, very critically ill, uh, luckily is now doing better. And so it's really impacting a lot of different people across the entire continuum of care.
Now that's stacked on top of the different clinical risks that we have, right? Where we're doing different types of ventilation, both invasive and non-invasive. We've certainly got things like nebulizer treatments that we know are critically important to our respiratory pa patients, like our COPDers and our emphysema patients and, and chronic bronchitis. Um, we've got to be aware of how we can mitigate the risk to our, our healthcare workers. So what's going on right now? Of course, we've got our normal flu season. We've got COVID, which luckily is not making as much of a rebound as we had you know, um, anticipated. We've got our normal circulating rhinoviruses. Certainly RSV is problematic right now, especially in our pediatric populations. Our regular adenoviruses and then strep seems to be making a huge dent, um, particularly in both the pediatric and adult populations. I've seen a ton of strep personally uh, just over the last few weeks. But we always go back to, if depending upon who you talk to, well, two years ago, it was always COVID. Well, maybe now people are saying, well, it's not flu, right? But we always have to see, sort of think the bigger picture, right? What is the potential differential diagnosis that will allow us to determine and how do we get there? Is there diagnostic testing, for example, that will be helpful? Um, is this patient truly symptomatic to the point that we should treat? Um, you know, is this a high risk patient where we should be more aggressive with that treatment? And especially with COVID, we've seen, you know, things sort of come on the market and off the market in terms of emergency use authorization. And so that makes it difficult to keep up with what the current sort of options are in our treatment arsenal. So I wanted to show you just a, a, a few graphs that I pulled just this morning from the CDC. So this information is current as of today, but again, um, if you're watching the recording, make sure that you go to the CDC website to pull the most current data for your area um, at that time. So this is COVID in the US um, so far, right? And if you look that the most current data that they posted was through 1119, so we're about you know two and a half weeks behind here. Um, but you see sort of with that nice big dip um, that we've had over the last looks like about September-ish timeframe. But if you look at historical trends, right, that holiday season, typically we're gonna see a bump. So we're really entering that. And if you look on the far right of the graph, you see that all these things are starting to go up, right? And so it does indicate that we're starting to see that initial holiday spike. And so that's something that we've got to be aware of. Well, what about our adenoviruses, right? You know, we've got the same problem here where we're seeing it sort of bounce all over the place. And what would be very helpful to know is how much of this is in the adult population versus the pediatric. Um, there are ways to drill down a little bit deeper into this data, but I really show it just for the premise of saying that we've got a lot of stuff circulating at the same time, right? And so are all things gonna need treatment? No. But are we going to treat them all pretty much the same way from an infection control perspective? Yes. Right. Our respiratory viruses, we know how they behave. We know the route of transmission primarily. We know how to stop that transmission. And a lot of this goes back to appropriate use of PPE, as well as good things like hand hygiene and disinfection. So interestingly enough, CDC also publishes data on our outpatient respiratory uh, illnesses. And so you can see sort of the, the number of uh, percentage of visits to a healthcare provider uh, for respiratory illness this, this week. Um, and then long-term care facilities, this number continues to go up. And so we, we wanna watch that carefully because we know that that can be a barometer for problem. Um, and so especially as we see residents become sick, that means that staff members might become sick, which means they can spread this to other parts of the community and certainly other healthy residents, right? And so we need to watch this, uh, particularly in the outpatient setting where a lot of these respiratory viruses are being treated. Um, what's interesting is the telehealth perspective. Uh, that is a new metric that CDC is hoping to start to add in in the 2023-2024 timeframe to really evaluate the impact of telehealth medicine, how we can appropriately screen for these viruses, and what, if any, treatment might be provided, because some of it very well may be inappropriate. We look a little bit deeper into um, you know, things like uh, flu. You can see the cumulative hospitalization rate there. Uh, the number of hospitalizations on the right, um, and then the pediatric deaths. Um, again, we're seeing a lot of pediatric hospitalizations though uh, with RSV uh, as well. So we are above the mortality threshold, which is not necessarily surprising for the time of year. Uh, and that is specifically an aggregate measure that's looking at pneumonia, influenza, as well as COVID-19 um, uh, in there. So just something to, to consider from that perspective. So what about influenza in general? Well, right, as you can see from the graph, the, the bulk of this is still influenza A. Um, you know, this was what I was convinced I had the other day. I just had that influenza-like feeling and I was shocked that I was not positive for influenza. Um, but we are seeing a ton of flu circulating around there. 
What's interesting too is that if you dig into the data more deeply about vaccination rate for influenza, we've seen some pretty significant changes over the last few years. Um, I've got my own personal theory um, on that, which is I think that we've seen a change in the general attitude towards vaccines because of the COVID vaccines. Um, I've even talked to friends, colleagues, and loved ones that have changed their attitude. Uh, and so these were folks that were previous very big supporters of the flu shot and are now starting to ask some, you know, sometimes very good and sometimes interesting questions, right, about the flu shot, which we know has a long history of success and efficacy. Uh, and so we certainly want to encourage and continue to encourage those, especially those that are high risk, uh, to become vaccinated as part of that influenza prevention strategy. So what about the common floor, right? Well, a lot of this goes back to what are the ways that we can break the chain? You know, we can clean surfaces or our fomites. We can disinfect those things. We can wear appropriate PPE like our mask. We can isolate patients, uh, particularly those that might infect other patients that might be well. Um, we don't want to cohort patients necessarily unless we can do so safely. So I don't necessarily want to put somebody with active influenza with an oncology patient, right? That would be bad. Um, and so it's really about this common sense approach. Now, one of the challenges we have in healthcare, of course, is staffing. We don't have enough staff to appropriately do the job and much less make good decisions. And so there's a lot of burden that may fall back onto our infection prevention and infectious disease colleagues that we have to really help as much as possible make good clinically based decisions based on data, common sense, as well as what we can do within the infrastructure uh, that we have logistically. And so a component of this is good screening. You know, at the very beginning of COVID, we did, you know, the temperature. Everything was about the temperature. And I kept screaming and saying, it's not just about the temperature, right? It's about travel history. It's about patient exposure. It's about their symptomology that they have. You know, what laboratory diagnostics can we do? Uh, what available resources do we have in our arsenal for both treatment and prophylaxis? Um, are there other vaccines and and anima, uh, anima, um you know, uh, anticlonal monobodies, I'm sorry, I can't even talk today. Um, anticlonal monobodies, forgive me, I cannot even say the word today. My tongue is twisted there. Um, these are all things that have changed over a period of time, right? Just yesterday, the FDA pulled back yet another resource that we had in our arsenal and removed the emergency use authorization, right? And, and so if you think about this in terms of our outpatient providers, especially, um, this is a challenge for us because we can't necessarily go to the literature or go to a particular website and get the most updated information. And so you see a ton of usage for applications like UpToDate, which is a great one that I recommend um, that allows us to at least digitally get access to that most updated information. Um, and then that way you can do that. The other resource too, I'd encourage you to check out is your public health department. Um, you know, you've got a lot of your colleagues from the state Depart uh, department of public health on with us today uh, that you can use uh, as well. So those screenings can be done with technology. Um, there's, there's checklists that we can use. And, and I, I would encourage us to, in some instances, hardwire this, um, especially places like pediatrician offices and outpatient clinics like urgent cares, uh, emergency department waiting rooms, where we can do a little bit more screening um, from, that, from that perspective to alert us to potential issues. The other component to this, too, is what's the compliance level from an infection control perspective, both with our staff as well as our visitors and our patients with the use of masks? Um, I would argue it's pretty low. Uh, I think we, we've got, you know, different opinions on that, and that's, that's fine, but my eyeballs tell a story. Um, I walk around, especially in public settings, and I see just really awful uses of masks. Um, and so we are reliant very, very heavily upon something that we know anecdotally is not very effective when it's improperly used. Uh, and so we, we've got to figure out better ways to sort of, um, you know, skim the cat there. So how about, you know, really determining what respiratory infection it is? You know, a lot of this is going to go back to the evaluation of the symptoms. But, you know, if I use myself as an example, um, I thought I had the flu. I, I felt like I had the flu. I felt like I had that, that you know, been run over by a Mack truck feeling. I was, I was febrile. Um, I just felt like crap, and and I thought it was the flu, but I wasn't. Um, and so even working through that differential in my own head and sort of playing out the different symptoms, any exposure that I had, my vaccination status, right, 
all of that stuff still led me to the wrong diagnosis. And so what did lead me to the right diagnosis though, was having access to diagnostics. And those rapid diagnostics can help us determine whether or not this is COVID or whether this is flu. We're seeing more and more um, rapid diagnostics that come out that test for both COVID and flu at the same time, which for a patient is very advantageous because it's one swab. And then of course, we've got our normal stuff like our seasonal allergies and our common colds. Um, I have terrible allergies. And so it's not uncommon whatsoever for me to wake up congested. And normally in about 30 to 45 minutes when I wake up and get moving, that's all moved on. Um, but you can tell sometimes when it's different. So ask the patient also what their baseline is. Now, once that respiratory virus enters, right, there's a lot of different things that are going to be influencing factors on whether or not that patient is going to develop a true response, right? And so we've got our immune response, our bacterial burden, our, our sort of composition in the community, right, our metabolic output, as well as the risk for new bacterial acquisition, right? The concurrent infections are the ones that also scare me a little bit in terms of these patients that are high risk. Maybe they've undergone a procedure, a recent hospitalization, a surgery, a bronchoscope, something like that. And now we get them potentially infected with these basic respiratory viruses. And it's not just the viruses that are out there as particulates. We've learned a ton from the operating room. If you've, if you've really read some of the good literature out from ARN on surgical smoke, um, it is quite scary. Uh, to see all the VOCs, the carcinogens, um, everything that is essentially floating in the air that we are inhaling on a regular basis. And so the same is true here as our respiratory droplet um, particles are in different sizes, it will dictate how from an infection control perspective, we need to wear different types of masks. Um, and then what the sort of risk is associated with that. You know, how long can we wear it? Is the appropriate mask at N95 or is it a regular surgical mask? Does it need to be fluid resistant or not, right? These are all questions that have to be assessed based on the pathogen as well as the anticipated risk exposure. And then if we stack on top of this, the anatomical perspective, right? Everybody's anatomy is different. And so, you know, I had terrible turbinate issues and I had um, obstructive sleep apnea uh, about 10 years ago and had surgery, made a huge difference in my ability to breathe. Um, but I also use a CPAP. And so all of these things change the anatomy and sort of the colonization um, that I have to be aware of. And so when I go to my ENT once a year for my checkup, you know, there's certain things that they're looking for that they don't normally look for in an average patient just because of the anatomy that they're aware of. And so this does matter, um, especially as we look at colonization. There are new technologies with the molecular testing where we can do molecular swabs and we can really recover a lot of different things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to treat that. What about the lower respiratory tract? right? We're seeing increases in rates of pertussis. Um, here in the area that I live, we've seen increases in tuberculosis as well. And we're certainly seeing, unfortunately, a ton of community acquired pneumonias. And so these are all things that we have to stack on top of what are the existing comorbidities that that patient may have? Um, or, you know, is this somebody that's doing, you know, really good re regular respiratory hygiene stuff? Um, are they maintaining and optimizing their immune system? Do they go into high-risk environments? You know, what's their, their normal state? Or is this somebody who, for example, may be a really critically ill asthmatic that's not well-controlled um, and something sets this off either environmentally or potentially from a micro perspective? And strep throat continues to be a problem for us. Um, like I said, I've seen tons of this in the last month alone, and not just in kids, but also in adults. And probably about 30% of those cases were um, specifically concurrent with influenza. Uh, and so it's interesting to see that. Um, and I would certainly welcome at the, at the end any comments from Dr. Ramirez on that, because I know he does a lot um, specifically with our respiratory pathogens. But, you know, these are things that we have to, to really be aware of. The great news is we can diagnose this quickly, right? We've got good rapid diagnostics. However, they have to be appropriately collected. And so that's a big thing to make sure that the staff that are doing this, which especially in the outpatient environment, are likely medical assistants. We've got to make sure they're properly trained um, so that we can detect these things, treat appropriately, and make sure these patients do well. Um, one of the other things I'll just mention here is a sort of anecdotal comment is penicillin allergy. You know, if you've got patients that are saying, I'm allergic to penicillin, ask what that allergy looked like. What happened? When was it? What was the resolution? Were they truly anaphylactic? Do they carry an EpiPen? Right? And you'll find that most patients are not truly allergic. Uh, the most recent data, it was astronomically overwhelming that said 
most of these folks are not allergic at all. And that can be cleared with a, a dermatological uh, simple test to do that. I actually fell into this category before I had surgery. So a child I had had a, a reaction was always told not to take it. Um, the, the surgeon was pretty adamant with the allergist. We want to retest you for this. And so I did it. And I've since taken penicillin with no, uh, no issues whatsoever. So it's a good drug to, to certainly have. Our dear friend, the, the common cold, right, is another one that we have out there. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of viruses that are certainly affecting the respiratory issues. These are things that are, are going to cause all of the nasal congestion, the secretions, the cough, right? We're seeing this very, very commonly, especially in our kids. Um, you know, you'll see this more and more, especially over the holidays, because we know that we're going to have people back together again, uh, for sure. You know, there is a lot of theory out there about are we seeing increases in respiratory viruses, as particularly the pediatric setting, because these kids were masked for, for so long. And I, and I think there could be some truth to that, for sure. Um, especially when you're covering those respiratory pathogens, they're not getting a lot of free air, or, I'm sorry, passages, and they're not getting a lot of free air, right? This is definitely something that we have to think about, sort of the double-edged sword. And then what about from an engineering perspective, things like Legionnaires? Uh, we had a case of this here in Atlanta a few years ago where this was found in a hotel. Several people actually died. Um, and so any type of water um, feature we've got to be aware of. Um, you know, also consider your outside sources too, like your HVAC system. And so it's not just the pathogens that we are normally dealing with, but the things that we might be introducing into the, to the population that we serve by having improper engineering or maintenance. Um, and so this is another pathogen that we have to be aware of. So what about RSV, right? This is one that is causing a ton of problems. Um, I know for our three pediatric hospitals here in Atlanta, uh, they're all on pediatric uh, diversion. They don't have any more beds and they're all full of, of kids with RSV. Uh, many of these kids were not historically super sick before. So it's about a 50-50 split, at least here in Atlanta. Um, and so that has been a little bit of a change. Normally it was kids that had other comorbidities that were typically hospitalized. I believe the national average is about 2% um, is, is what they see as the hospitalization rate. But we, we see a pretty big increase in this. And this has become a resource strain. Um, and so if you look at the American um, Academy of Emergency Physicians and some other groups, they've even asked the federal government for relief on this, um, particularly with reimbursement and, and staffing assistance in, in terms of, of financial help, um, just because there are simply just not enough people, right? In our infant population, we know that this can be problematic, especially for our, our NICU environments. And so good disinfection of those bassinets, those incubators, um, the shared environmental surfaces, good hand hygiene, and then certainly making sure that folks that are coming in and out are not going to be transmitters. Um, that's going to be helpful for us um, and also good suctioning uh, from that perspective. With our adult population, we know that this attacks um, certain people, typically those with existing chronic uh, respiratory conditions. And so we wanna be aware of that and manage those patients appropriately. This is where telehealth can be helpful for us because it can give us more immediate access to these patients. But again, you've still gotta have a provider on the other end of that line. And so if we fail to have enough providers, adding telehealth slots with nobody to see them doesn't really do us a lot of good. And so better screening of these patients will be helpful in terms of identifying, hey, you're high risk. If you develop these types of symptoms, here's what I want you to do immediately. And then call our office and have a protocol so that we can prevent, you know, hospitalizations that are completely preventable. So what about environmental disinfection with these respiratory viruses? Almost all of the respiratory viruses that we're talking about, right, with very, very few exceptions can be taken care of with a low level intermediate, I'm sorry, low level EPA registered disinfectant. There will be a few, right, that do require an intermediate level disinfectant, but very, very few and far between. And so you'll find that the commercial products on the US market, at least, are all going to be at least low level. Many of them are going to be intermediate level. And just as a refresher, the difference between low and intermediate level is simply microbacterium. So microbacterium, we're most familiar with microbacterium tuberculosis, not something we find on our surface, but it is something that is very difficult to inactivate. Um, and so if we can be effective against that as a disinfectant, then we're effective against everything below that that has a lower resistance profile in order to kill it. Um, and so at least use a low level disinfectant, but preferably intermediate. It's always going to get you a, a bigger bang for your buck. You'll see the term hospital grade. Um, that is a little bit of an antiquated term that we've used for years that essentially um, 
basically said this, these three organisms that are on this product were designed for hospital usage. As we all know now, community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, all those things, the pathogens cross boundaries. And so this is a less important term than before, but broad spectrum activity against gram positive and gram negative bacteria, your envelope to non enveloped viruses, your fungal organisms, all of this is important, right? And so that combined with sort of the logistics of the low overall contact time, you know, the ability to use it with the patient in the room, hopefully, as well as the general safety profile and, and the PPE usage gets us to a better spot. The key with respiratory viruses is to make sure that you follow the contact time, right? So don't, don't shortchange it. Don't, don't shortcut anything. Make sure you use the full contact time for the product so that you can do that. And the same is going to be true when we look at our, our AGPs, our aerosol generating procedures, right? The level of respiratory protection for the team in the room is going to be dictated by the risk. Right. And so most of these cases, it would be prudent to wear an N95 or higher respirator mask. But that also means that we need to be wearing eye protection. Um, and so if you're doing like a deep bronch and you're going to be doing suctioning and sputum um, sampling and stuff like that and flushes and, and lavages, you need to make sure you're covering your eyes as well. Um, and so for high risk environments like bronch suites and, and pulmonary de uh, departments, ERs, you know, this may be something where we can provide better PPE like face shields to people that can be reused so that we're a little bit more prepared, right? And, and the CDC does provide this list for what those procedures include, but we all know that there's other things outside of that that may be risky for us. I purposely picked this picture because you can see what I call the intubation box, um, where anesthesia is essentially putting a box there um, to cover any potential secretions. These have been proven essentially to be completely unnecessary and, and not worth it. Um, and so I, I just throw that out there that there was a lot of quote unquote commercial innovation in the time of the pandemic that has really proven to, uh, to, at least in my mind, as a reminder to go back to the basic principles of infection control, right? The other thing too, from a clinical perspective is that just because we have to be worried about it doesn't mean we should be doing it. So if I've got a patient that needs a continuous nebulizer, then by darn, they're getting a continuous nebulizer. I need to figure out the infection control perspective to protect my team, but it does not give us permission to deviate from standard of care um, and really get that patient less than what they need in order to successfully treat that condition. And a big piece of this, right, is working within the guidelines of OSHA and NIOSH and CDC to determine the type of respiratory protection that we need um, to make sure that it is really centered around what is the anticipated risk, um, how long will they be wearing it is important for sure, um, and then is that product going to be approved and fit tested appropriately. Uh, and so the one on the sort of top left, it's a little bit difficult to see, is a uh, lastimeric respirator. That is one that I'm a big fan of because they're very comfortable to wear. Um, they're reusable. They have a very long shelf life. And it still allows you the opportunity to have continuous respiratory protection that's 100% within your control, right? So you don't have to reprocess them or anything like that. You can just disinfect it with a regular wipe there. Now, as we look in the future, right, how do we move this needle forward? Well, we can do better infection control for sure. We can have, you know, improved vaccines and prophylactics. Uh, we need access certainly to better therapeutic treatments so that when patients do become ill, we can properly treat them with a more individualized approach based on their comorbidities and risk profile. And we have to get better about identifying these infections up front so that we can uh, isolate and do any diagnostics necessary uh, as well. Now, this requires a huge team. Right. And it's not just about the frontline providers. It's not just about physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs. It's really about all of us. Right. And that also includes our vendors, um, the folks that actually make these medications, these vaccines to understand the needs that we have, uh, deliver upon those from an innovation perspective, and then make sure that we have a better integrated public health surveillance and response strategy. I'll tell you, one of the things that scares me to death is that we have decimated public health, right? We, we already had a very, very, um, let's just say fragile public health system before COVID um, because we have not invested in it as a country for many years. Um, and now we have seen so many people leave public health because of COVID that we really have a very, very weak infrastructure in many aspects. And so we always need to support our public health colleagues and do whatever we can to assist them. Don't over rely upon things like visual alerts. This is a beautiful poster. It's pretty clear to me. It's got good visuals to it. But we all know that people don't follow directions, 
But the other thing too, is that we historically do a awful job of making it easy for them to do so. Perfect example, I can't tell you how many hospitals I've walked into and I look and I'm like, where's your PPE station? Where's your, you know, your cough etiquette station? And I look and I'm pointed over to the corner of the lobby because they don't want it out because it's not pretty, right? It's not, a, infection control is not about being pretty. It's not about the mahogany wood or anything like that. It's about the practicality of saving lives and preventing transmission. And so sometimes we need to be prepared to go to battle with our interior decorators that seem to have a lot of power. And that team is going to be built upon our laboratories where we can get better diagnostics, our pharmaceutical companies, where we can get better treatment options and vaccines. Certainly, we need more active engagement with the FDA. Um, that is something that is really, really critical so that at the front lines, we can do better delivery of medicine and, and public health can have more resources to be successful within that role. So as we look forward, right, surveillance and, and better alert systems that are real time give us the ability to act quickly, right? We're not being retrospective in our view, we're being much more proactive. And then we've got to, as frontline healthcare leaders and providers, focus on those core strategies, right? Those hand hygiene, the, the appropriate use of PPE, making sure that we disinfect surfaces, all of that is gonna be an important and critical element in the success. So while COVID uh, certainly is an ongoing threat that we have, it's just one right? It's one of those respiratory pathogens. And we know that some of this stuff is seasonal, like our RSV and our flu, um, but a lot of this stuff goes on throughout the year, our colds, right? We see a lot of the rhinoviruses, the adenoviruses. And so the more diagnostic capabilities that we can have to isolate when needed, some things we don't need to do that for, um, and treat when we can, um, is going to be helpful for us. It's going to make sure that we don't see such rapid transmission, especially in congregate settings like schools and daycares and offices and stuff like that. And I would tell you to look critically at the data. Um, there's things where I've frankly picked up the phone and called the CDC and said, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. And it was an error, right? And no one had, had said anything to them. Um, and so don't be afraid to ask questions and, and really to float that stuff up uh, when necessary. Here's a couple of additional resources in case you're interested um, in that so that you've got access to that as well. And then I'll stop uh, Dr. Maris and see if there's any questions. And certainly I uh, would love your opinion. I know this is your uh, specialty area as well. So love for you to chime in. Thank you very much. It was a, a great uh, overview in exactly 30 minutes. Um, and we'll, we'll see if there's any uh, comments or, or questions in the, in the chat, please. Um, be sure to write your, your comments. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of uh, considerations to, to discuss, but I want to, uh, but it has been uh, in, the, in, the, in the literature or even in the, uh, in the press, the idea of that we're having now uh, influenza and RSV and and COVID-19, this triple pandemic, serious pandemic, uh, and and there's a lot of uh, questions. Why do we think that this happened? Why do we think that that, that we're having these three viruses circulating at the same time and really having a, a bad issue? Because it has been a, uh, before COVID, it has been a long time that we don't have all the hospitals across the country in in diversion. Uh, so many people hospitalized. Uh, do you have any, um, and of course, we don't know why this happened. It's difficult to understand viruses, but, but what would be your consideration? Why are we having such a bad uh, influenza season, such a bad uh, RSV season? And again, as you mentioned, COVID is slightly moving up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really a, a couple of things. And I've actually had this conversation with a couple of the virologists over at CDC, and I think part of it is that we've definitely let our, our guard down in terms of basic infection control. Um, you know, at the very height of COVID, we were religious about washing our hands. We were, we were religious about disinfection. We were religious about PPE. And, and that sort of waned off. And I think a lot of that, you know, there's compassion fatigue, and then I call it PPE fatigue um, or infection control fatigue. And, and it's a term that we really need to acknowledge that people are just tired. Um, you know, it's not that they want to, to, to do the wrong thing. I just think they physically can't um, from that perspective. So I think that's issue number one. Issue number two, I think, is that we've seen a decrease in, in flu vaccinations, for sure. 
Um, we, we've seen this across the country. CDC's acknowledged this. They're doing massive uh, PSAs right now to increase flu vaccination rates. But we're now December 7th. So we're right in the middle of the flu season. Um, you know, I got my flu shot. Actually, Ruth gave it to me um, you know, the first week of October. I have it on my calendar every year. Uh, to make sure that I do that. And, you know, I always check with her on the latest vaccine availability, just because I, I want to take that seriously. But I know a lot of healthcare providers and friends of mine that did not get the flu shot that always have. Um, and so there's been a shift there that I think needs to be addressed. Um, the RSV thing is interesting because, you know, so many kids, depending upon where you lived, were forced to wear masks for you know, years at a time now, and they also were removed from social settings. Um, some kids have not even had social exposure for a period of time because they essentially were born into COVID um, and have not had that. And so you know, your, your normal immune system and exposure has been dampened. Um, and, and I'm not by any means saying go out and throw them into the, to the wolves, um, but I do think that we can all agree that there's some value in getting that traditional environmental exposure, developing that immunity, getting that resistance um, there. And, and we've seen this a lot. And, and anecdotally, a lot of the kids that I've seen that have been more sicker are the ones that have not had exposure to other kids or other places. Um, and then when they do go to daycare, they become pretty violently ill um, because they've had this sort of initial exposure. So I think it's a combination um, of all of those things. But again, I always go back to what can we do that makes common sense? What can we do that's consistent? Um, and then how do we make sure that people believe in the science behind it? We don't, we've not spent a ton of time explaining lessons learned from COVID. And I frankly think that that's a mistake. There's, there were things that we did incredibly well. There were things that we did that were, I think we could say are okay. And there were things that we did that we shouldn't have done. Um, and we have to acknowledge all three of those and, and scientifically say, let's learn from these together. Let's share the findings. And I think people will gain a lot of trust that way, um, too. What do you think? Uh, you alluded that uh, there is a controversy now with the, with the mask. Uh, uh, and, you know, how we have a time that everybody was using masks uh, across the uh, in society and there were mandatory masks in the hospitals and now masks are out, but, but what is your, your you, from one extreme to the other, how do you see masks uh, at this moment in the in the midst of, because the primary problems are influenza virus B. Again, as you mentioned, COVID is not, it's not, a, it's not a major problem at this moment, but uh, and, and what would be your consideration? Some would say, okay, Hudson, how do you see masks at this moment? That's a, uh... That's a very charged question. Um, I, I, I think it depends. You know, if first of all, we know that the general public, for the most part, does not appropriately wear a mask correctly. So we need to, you know, guidance on on what a mask is and what a mask isn't is is important for sure. Um, you know, wearing a mask below your nose, wearing a mask that you've worn for five weeks. You know, having fifty masks around your your. Um, your rear view mirror, which I see frequently, those are all bad things, right? And, and th that's that's the fault of the education of, of our public. We have to do better with that. Um, that being said, I don't, I don't personally wear a mask everywhere I go. Um, I'm very, very religious about my hand hygiene. I'm, I'm good about my disinfection. I, I rinse my nasal passages every day. Um, I, I try to take basic precautions. Um, and certainly when I do patient care, um, depending upon what I'm doing, I'm going to take the appropriate precautions there. I think looking at a better understanding of what type of mask to. So normally, if I'm going to do something, I'm wearing a fluid resistant mask, which a lot of places are not thinking about. So if you're really, truly concerned about respiratory secretions, that fluid resistance pathway of the mask membrane is important. And a lot of hospitals are not providing those um, unless you ask. And so we've got to ask for the right PPE also, but wearing the same thing on your face all day long over and over again, I don't think is probably the best thing to do. And there's a study uh, currently taking place right now that I'm aware of in the operating room where they're looking at perioperative providers, specifically anesthesia, where they're wearing the same surgical mask during every case of the day all day long. And they're finding that their rates of respiratory illness are significantly higher than those that actually change the mask between patients. Um, so there's, there's, I think there'll be some interesting data that will hopefully guide us to have better conversations about this topic. There was another um, thing that, that, that we were doing during uh, COVID that was the idea that, okay, anyone that 
if you are not completely healthy, stay home. Mm-hmm. And they will figure out what to do with you. But this was the time that the only way to be sick was COVID. Then if you were having anything respiratory, was COVID, you stay home. Um, now, uh, most of the respiratory that we see are, you know, RSV, as you said, adenovirus, uh, there's a lot of rhinovirus. Then and people have a common cold. Uh, and, and how do we, what is the recommendation now? Because if everybody with a common cold is going to stay home until you get a diagnosis, we are going to have now in the winter, we already have problems with, with not enough staff. And if we ask half of the staff, stay home until I get a PCR to see that. I mean, how, how do you see this, this idea of uh, if you have a runny nose, don't come to work? Is this, do you think that this is going to be valid during this winter or we need to, um, or do you just come to work with a mask and then do the test? How do you see this moving forward? So it's it's ironic. So I have a, a, a group that I work with that's a, a very, very large company that we would all know, um, international company, that I work with them on their, their infection control for their, their offices and their, their operations. Um, and this has come up. They actually have had this problem. So during COVID, they paid 100%, um, even up to the 14 days at the time that that was the recommendation for people to be out of work. Um, if they were actually ill, they had specific protocols. And so, of course, they've since scaled that back a little bit. Um, and they do still pay for them if they are diagnosed with COVID to stay home. Um, but they've had, to your point, about 64% as of this morning on a call I was on of their workers that are calling in are not having COVID. They're not testing positive for anything with any type of swab. Um, and it's it's most likely either allergies or a common cold or something of that nature. And so they're now adjusting their policy to say, you know, do a test. If your test is negative and you're afebrile, um, you know, wear a mask when you come in. Um, and so they're still asking those people to come in because they're, you know, they're they're seeing impacts to their workplace for sure. And, you know, if you're testing negative multiple times, which these people are, they've got enough data that suggests if they've not had a single person that is tested negative with their protocol and then come to work and subsequently tested positive. So they do a follow-up test three days later. Um, and, and so far, no one has slipped through the cracks from that perspective. And I think that's a pretty critically thinking organization that's saying, let's do the right thing in terms of balance. We need to staff the operation, but we also don't want to infect other, you know, uh, workers in our, in our operations. And we're going to make sure we take care of our associates. So that's probably a good hybrid approach to, to think about for other organizations, but we can't, like you said, we can't call out of work just because we have a runny nose. That's just not, that's just not going to work. Okay. Well, um, this has been uh, great, and we went to the 15 minutes. We can continue, but I probably said that it's, it's going to be 12.45. We mentioned that 30 minutes presentation, 15 minutes. It's, it's good that we receive uh, comments from you, from the audience, regarding what topics uh, you want to have. Please send us your comment, because we try to respond based on your uh, request. Um, uh, Hudson, again, thank you very much. It was a great uh, overview of, uh, and thank you for your insight during the questions and answers. Uh, and thank you, everybody. I will see you um, this coming uh, Wednesday. Thank you.